afternoon colleagues, goeiemiddag, collega's, lekker om julle te sien, sommer uh, vol lokaal hier so aan die einde van die jaar en um, ek sien om my die enthousiaste vir leer en onderig. It's really nice to see all the enthusiasts about uh, in teaching and learning around and um, I see you as the yeast in the institution. Eventually you influence more and more people to make teaching and learning more accessible to our students and hopefully much more enjoyable to each one of you. Um, so we're looking forward to the seminar. Just before I introduce um, Martin, I thought it's the last one. Um, I'm going to pass this around. I hope you had something to eat. This is a small sign of appreciation for what you're all doing for teaching and learning. So just pass it around. Oh, there should be enough for each one. Okay, so let me introduce our speaker of the day, Martin Butler. Martin is a senior lecturer at our University of Stellenbosch Business School on our Belleville Park uh, campus and is also a research associate at the Institute for Future Studies. He's an electronic engineer, uh, did his degree at Pretoria and then he continued with an MBA at Stellenbosch, which he completed cum laude and the field of specialization that he took on um, is project management. He joined the academia after a couple of years in industry um, in 2007. 15 years he spent in the ICT industry and uh, embarked on a number of projects throughout South Africa with teams and also abroad and specifically focusing on information and communications technology. And that is why I think it's so special to have someone like him who also takes a keen interest in teaching and then to understand how the related field of fields of communications, um, information technologies, project management and innovation is not only combined in industry to make a big difference everywhere, but it's also combined in our own institution and in particular in teaching and learning to make a big difference in how we will go about learning in our institution. He's passionate about the utilization of ICT in teaching and learning. You will hear that from his presentation. And he's actually the driver about, uh, 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 of one of our flagship programs at the business school, the MBA, and making that available to students who cannot participate full-time in a classroom in one location for a good portion of the year. He will tell us how he did it, and he's currently still heading up the MBA program that's offered by means of a hybrid of contact time and also technology. And I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from Martin his presentation. So after his presentation, I believe we will have um, quite a bit time of time, say 15, 20 minutes for questions, for comments. And uh, let's make this a learning opportunity for all of us once again. Thank you, Martin. We appreciate it. And we, look, we appreciate it and we're looking forward to your presentation and the discussion afterwards. Um, I, I'm actually mic'd, so I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Schoenwinkel, colleagues, good afternoon. Um, thank you for um, spending uh, half an hour with me. Um, when I received the invite from, from JP, um, the immediate title that, that sprung to mind um, was not standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I thought I would go for eating our own dog food. And, um, but I was convinced that that's apparently not the appropriate title. Um, but it is the bulk um, of what I would like to share with you today, how at the business school, I think, um, a, a team of individuals over a lengthy period of time by eating our own dog food um, learned a lot and, and continue to learn. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share. And um, I will gladly take any questions afterwards, but I'm fairly informal. If you want to stop me at any stage and ask questions, you are very welcome to do that as well. Um, in terms of the, the invite that I received from JP, um, it contained an interesting little tidbit in there. It says, um, fun, fun, it, a scholarly informed hook, but a leer and honor seminar. Mm -hmm. And um, coming from the business school, I immediately picked up the angle in there. It says, don't come and talk about um, fuzzy things. Come and tell us about something um, fundamental that we can ground it in. Now, um, Arnold, it's interesting. You talked about my passion for technology. I'm an electronic engineer, but um, the day when I completed my engineering degree, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. 
So I became a work school underwriter by work school Bronco Sprite, and I taught mathematics for one year. Um, it was the most fantastic year of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I realized that that's not my career, um, but um, it was my passion, and 15 years later, where I could join academia, um, I was very happy to do that. Now, the question is, is what, what do we do um, at the business school that is then scholarly informed, and what, what can we bring from the business school that is scholarly informed? And um, I would like to explain to you just very briefly our approach to lecturing because um, our students are, are post-grad. Um, we have um, 24 students which are full-time students um, and our students are all post-experience. So it's all post-grad, all post-experience post students and you walk into a classroom like this and if you tell a student that's something that they cannot apply next week or the week thereafter, you have a little bit of a problem because they tell you that immediately. And um, it's a fantastic environment to lecture in because they keep you honest and it's also an environment that you have to think um, very clearly of how do you actually deal with theory and um, after trying to to get a mental picture in my head over a period of time um, this is the best that I that I can actually create is to say that within the business school environment um, we always have an appreciation for the theory the techniques the principles and the fundamental things that we teach and I think if you step out of that and you shouldn't be within a university we also sit and practice that our students have practical problems we bring the problems into a classroom as being a case study or the student will tell you when I was standing in the queue in spar yesterday or when a client told me I cannot do this. And that's this world here at the bottom, the real life situations. And, and our world is, is sitting here in the middle um, and where the real learning to an extent happens. Um, the way I sometimes explain it to students is say is, you have a loose screw in your house. For years you've used the knife to put the screw in until somebody one day tells you about a screwdriver. And from that day on which you can never be the same again because you always go and search for the screwdriver as being the theory, the technique, the principle to, to tighten all those screws. Although the knife from the color the, the, the kitchen also worked. You, you had a little bit of heat from your spouse about the bent tip of the knife, but it worked to tighten that screw. And I'm talking from real experience here. And um, that's and in, to an extent what we would um, what what we teach. And what I would like to do today is to explain to you how we use some of these theories um, in our digitization um, of our programs and our, and our modes of delivery at the business school. Now, um, one of the probably the most used quotes in the business school. Um, is from Kurt Levin from, from MIT in 1945 that says um, nothing is as practical as a good theory. And um, it's, it's interesting for me in my 15 years in industry, sometimes the phrase that is so theoretical would be used to dismiss something of not being significant value. If you do something, a person will say, oh, that's so theoretical. But by that, they actually mean it doesn't have value where it's actually the exact opposite. <laughs> where theory is something that we've observed in practice, we wrote it down, and now because we know that it's immensely valuable for us, like a screwdriver is to screws, there's a little bit of theory. And um, we then, in this um, effort of ours, then say to ourselves, um, what are the theories that underpins this transition? And I would like to explain a little bit of that for you, for you today. So um, our technological transformation, which is not what I'm here about, just very, very quickly, um, four years ago we established what we call the local classroom. What it would mean is that in a classroom like this, if you walk into the classroom, there would be 40 students in front of you, and there would be another 40 students dispersed globally. Um, you just walk into the classroom, you teach with them. It's synchronous learning. There is no video watching afterwards, although we do record, like Henny is recording, and, and it's available afterwards. But the students physically have to attend the class. They can just attend the class from anywhere. And to an extent, it's transparent for us. I walked, you will remember the massive heat wave two weeks ago. I walked into the classroom on Wednesday, evening with short sleeves and I immediately said to my students uh, I do apologize but today it is a heat wave in Cape Town I'm wearing a golf shirt it's really really hot and one of the students online immediately chirped me Ilana Kruger and she said to me it is snowing where I am now I know her because she's an engineer at uh, 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 iron mine in Springbok and I said to her Ilana I'm fairly sure it is not snowing in Springbok and she said no I moved to Canada a month ago Sure. But for our systems, it was completely transparent. So she's in Canada, she's teaching classes from Canada. Um, she will hopefully graduate with the rest of her cohort that she started with. Um, but we've had students moving to Dubai, to New Zealand, moving back and fro. And especially even our co-located students, when they move around, um, they attend class from Heathrow Airport, from the Symphony, um, from wherever they, wherever they find themselves. Now, of course, there's a very other interesting conversation here about what we enable students to do, but I'm not going to go into that. I just want to explain to you, this was fundamental in our transformation, what we call our global classroom. 
And um, together with this, about 20 to 30 other sets of technologies, some of the USB staff that are sitting here, um, instrumental in terms of how we use SunLearn, um, how we stream <coughs> our lectures, how we have interactive experiences with our students. Now, that's the, the portfolio of programs at the business school. We started firstly um, in the left uh, uh, bottom corner um, with our postgraduate diploma, then we extended to the MBA program, and then to our future studies programs, and, and currently um, we will probably within the next year extend it to our development finance programs, um, as well as to our postgraduate diploma in financial planning, um, due to the increased geographical footprint to, to accommodate students from everywhere. The um, challenge for us is that we didn't really have a burning platform. Um, when you have to move to new technology and things are not working, if, you, if your car is not starting in the morning or a couple of mornings on a cold winter's morning, you are ready to buy a new car. But if your car is still light on fuel and still working and all of these things, then you can't really make that emotional step towards that new purchase. And um, in this instance, we didn't really have a burning platform with the USB. We were, we were doing okay. Um, we, our student numbers grow, uh, grew um, constantly. Um, we had our challenges and up and downs like the rest of university. Um, but there was no real burning platform. It was not as if we knew we had to do this. Fast forward four years later, I can tell you that there's a burning platform now if we didn't make this transition four years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, from a timing perspective, I think we did it well. And I'm often asked, so, so what did we do? Um, because you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, it turns out that um, if you lead um, a horse to the water, and you raise the water level right <laughs> to the right level. Um, they don't really have an opportunity not to drink from that particular water. If you walk into the classroom and um, that is the setup that you're dealing with, is you have to drink or swim or die. And to an extent, it's one of the brave steps that we did. Is you can plan and plan and plan and spin around and in the world of project management. You can plan a project for 100 years, but it's that one second after you start the project that the real learning is happening. And it was only when we did our first lecture that we figured out things that we didn't necessarily know. Um, I remember, for example, between one, week one and two, um, I needed to establish a code of conduct for the local classroom. Um, we had the breakfast host of UFM, Anna Fisser, in the class, and the very first day she got in and said, Anna is here. And when she said, Anna is here, somebody answered in Afrikaans, and then somebody in Kozo, and then somebody in Kazakhstan, and somebody in Russian, and we, we had a problem. I said, okay, guys, so in the online classroom, this is... And within those first weeks, um, we drank a lot of water and we learned a lot, um, but we were ready and we were a lot of people looking at this environment and helping the horse to drink. Now, in terms of eating our own dog food, um, there's really three theories that was fundamental to our transformation. Three tools or techniques that we um, took from the body of knowledge and that we applied in a very, very particular way in the USB. And um, I would like to just very briefly expose you to those theories. I think for some of them, some of, some of them are well known to you. Um, but I would just like to explain how um, we took certain elements um, of each of these theories. Um, the first one um, is the socio-technical theory, um, then uh, the technology acceptance model, um, innovation diffusion, and then I will talk about the McClone, uh, Delaney McClone um, I success model a little bit later because we, 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 we're not there yet. It's something that, we, that we're starting to use now. So allow me to share with you, um, just from those three blocks, um, our learning experience um, really over the last four years and, and, and on an ongoing basis. The first theory that we found very interesting in this journey comes from 1977. And in the field of information systems and technology, you quite often hear about, oh, everything is new, I walked into the classroom, it's new, and all of these things. Um, but it's interesting because this theory was born in 1977 because of an over-optimistic expectation of what technology could do sounds very, very real because it sounds like I'm facing on the governing bodies of schools over the last couple of years. Give the children tablets and everybody will learn fantastically. This is the way to go for the future. <coughs> That's really interesting because the research tells us in some schools fantastic and other schools terrible. So clearly that is not the entire picture to put a tablet in front of a child. And what the social technical theory in 1977 already said, it says is there's an interdependency between the tasks that I need to do the technology that I'm deploying, the organization which is happening, and the structure that I use to do that. Now, today, this theory is really not used in that format anymore, but it still underpins a lot of the more modern theories um, in the information systems world, and it's because of this over-optimism on what technology can do for us, which I think is still omnipresent today. We're on the 
in the era of big data and artificial intelligence and the fourth industrial revolution and many of these things are doing amazing things in, in our context and our environment and, and others not, not necessarily so. So what did we take from the, the social technical theory? Um, th this is extremely well known and I'm, I'm running the risk of losing some of you know like the students in the classroom falling asleep um, because you've all seen the three circles but um, we had a very interesting take on this because we said Yes, um, it's about um, the interdependence between all of these things. But we very quickly moved out of the technology space. So the moment that somebody would have exposed us to some new technology, um, the conversation we very quickly pushed out of that and said, of course, yes, there's fantastic things. Yes, um, SunLearn is one of the biggest underexploited resources in the University of Stellenbosch. Um, we don't use a lot of what that platform can do. It's an amazing platform. But the challenge is actually if we bring new technology into the classroom, um, what does it firstly mean in terms of our processes? How does it take our teaching? How will I teach different from what I teach last week? What I do? More importantly, how does it change the learning? How does it change the student learning? Um, one of the quotes that shaped my own thinking on this was 10 years ago, and it says, the good teacher walks into the classroom and asks the children, please switch on your mobile phones, because then I embed it within the learning processes. And we had to ask ourselves, are we doing something for the sexiness of the technology, or are we embedding it in what we believe to be best learning practices? And I'll do a, sh a, short, a quick exercise with you on that shortly. Um, and then in terms of the people side, um, very interesting. Um, a, a lot of diverse faculty at the business school, a lot of at young faculty, faculty that's been in the process for a long time. Um, the, the, the theory tells us to acknowledge the fear. Um, the way that I think in the school sometimes is, if you're the teacher, a mathematics teacher in a school, and, and you've, you've been using chalk to write on a, on a blackboard, um, for 20 or 30 years, if the chalk broke, you pulled out a drawer and you put a new piece of chalk and you continued writing, you were in complete control of the technology that you used in your environment. Now, if you're using the overhead projector and the laptop and the internet and all of these things and something goes wrong, you are exposed in that environment as not being in complete control of that which you do. And that creates a significant amount of fear in those which is facilitating the learning process at that particular point in time. So you have to acknowledge that. And um, it's interesting, even before this presentation now, I want to pop over to the internet now. And as I switch on my laptop and I open INET Key, I say to myself, I just hope INET Key doesn't drop off before I need to do my online thing here because then. So, so even as much as what I'm an electronic engineer, I love technology, come from with that, there's a fear embedded in here. Will what I use actually work in that particular environment? Then it's about enabling capacity, so I'll do a little bit of exercise on that later. Providing support, and then I think very, very importantly is recognizing progress. Um, we are sitting in a very interesting business model in the business school in terms of what we are rewarded for and what is recognized. Um, if you have a faculty member um, that has gone the extra mile, that's walked the extra route, and they really embed this within their own teaching and the learning of the students, is what are the incentives? And I, and I think, Renal, I have to acknowledge, I think within our faculty, um, there's actually lovely, lovely incentives, and even the, the teaching and learning conference that, that happened last week as well. Um, there's a significant amount of opportunities to acknowledge faculty that has walked the extra mile in terms of embedding the technology um, within their teaching and showing how it impacted student learning and proving that it actually had a positive impact on student learning. And then, of course, I'm a very firm believer of the power of pinotage. Um, I think it's one of the top products of Stellenbosch University. So um, every now and again, is, is you just have to create some informal sessions, um, have a bit of pinotage, with the heat now, pinotage, rosé, ice cold, but still pinotage, and just sit around, have a conversation, and say, what did you do, what worked, what didn't work, what did you mess up, what did you not necessarily mess up? If you don't do that, it's very easy for the faculty to become um, despondent in terms of the process that, they, that they're going through. Mm -hmm. So um, the second model um, that we found immensely valuable was the technology acceptance model. Um, th this is one of the fundamental theories in information systems. And what the technology acceptance model says is, when do we use new things? Um, if you give me this clicker, will I use it or not? If you give me a mobile phone, if you give me a camera, when will I use that? Now, um, there are multiple versions of, of this theory, and um, to this day, we keep on expanding and understanding better and better. I have a student that's doing brilliant research using the latest version of that now to, to understand why do we not use the voice assistants on our mobile phones, um, because according to the model, we should be doing that. Th th there's two fundamental attributes in the, in the original version of the model. The first one says is it needs to be useful. Um, if you give me something and it's not useful, I'm not going to use it. If you give me this glass over here and it contains my liquid, 
I will use it because it has an element of usefulness. If there is no inherent use in it, then you have a bit of a problem because now you need to do sticks and carrots to get me to use something because I do not necessarily see the use of that. And that is very true for technology in the classroom as well. Um, if we have um, students um, discussing with us online <coughs> in the Blender channel, um, one of the first things, um, unintended consequences, is um, the online students, um, can't, cannot, they can't speak to us, but we don't keep the voice open. So it's not an open channel. The student cannot opt to just speak to us. The students type to us. So the students tell us, they type these messages. The messages appear in the back of the room. So I would get to the left and I would say, oh, Peter, that's an interesting question. I would deal with that. Peter's an interesting question. I will deal with your question. And then I will go online. I would say, oh, okay, so that's an interesting question. I will deal with that question as well. What we found out is that some of the students sitting in the classroom prefer to rather type their questions to appear on the board and not to raise their hands in the classroom. It allowed them the time to formulate their questions properly and they would sit there and they would really think about what they would like to do because they don't want to sound as if they don't necessarily follow the lecture or what you're busy with. And by typing their questions for it to appear in the back, um, they have the time to formulate it properly. And it was something that we didn't necessarily um, intend to use and just so, uh, told us that that back channel is immensely useful if it is used in the correct way. By the way, the reason we don't enable voice on that, if, if, if Nikki on Aris here can't get one listener to switch off his radio, imagine 40 <laughs> students do um, all simultaneously. Um, you can hear the noise of a dog barking in Namibia on a ship sailing in Kenya. And um, so, so we, we, we do use the voice, but then I'm saying I'm going to hand over to Jacques Tolsma in Dubai, which I did three weeks ago, and Jacques did his presentation from Dubai, and then he handed the voice back to me. So we don't have an open communication with the students, although the technology that we use um, can, can actually do that. Now, um, I thought, uh, apologies, here's just the latest version. So I, all I want sure. to say is, is um, that's now the busy version. So, so today, if you look, talk about technology acceptance in model, um, this is where we are. We know it's a little bit more than that. But it still boils down to, is it useful and is it easy to use? If it's easy to use and it's useful, then the faculty will, will actually adopt that. So I thought, um, let's try a little bit of an experiment. I would like you to use your mobile <coughs> phones or tablets or whatever that you are connected with. And I'd like you to go to a website called Menti. And um, this, is an, this is an experiment that I did with the faculty at the business school. And um, all that I'm going to do now on the board there, you see, um, this is um, just the, the construct for usefulness and ease of use from the original um, article from Davies. And he says usefulness we can measure as quality, blah, 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 all of these things. Ease of use is a cumbersome learning curve, mental mode, understandable. So um, I think, um, let me try to explain it in a way um, that we did it with the faculty. Um, because on Venti, um, what I would like you to do is to, to firstly um, give me the phrases um, that represents the biggest challenges for you in the classroom. So if you go to Menti and you type in the code 697067, um, if you type in that code, um, you will see um, this question appearing for you. And when this question appears, there will be five spaces. Now you can put in one word or a phrase in there to tell me what is the biggest challenges in the classroom. Not technology associated challenges, challenges. I couldn't care less about technology. A challenge that will probably be there in 10 years time is there today, was there 10 years ago and was there 20 years ago. What, what do you think are the, the fundamental challenges um, that we are sitting with um, in, in the classroom? Three answers, three single word answers, six, seven, eight. Roughly 40 people, it seems we can get up to 20 maybe. And um, but I think the, the, the trend is fairly clear here. Um, there's, there's a fair amount of things that happen, from unpreparedness and needs for entertainment, tired students, um, listening big classes, um, but there's two things that emerge very, very clear. Well, probably a single one, and that is engagement. Mm -hmm. And um, engagement has absolutely nothing to do with technology. 
Um, if we didn't engage the students in our learning process 20 years ago, 10 years ago, today, and in 10 years time, um, we have a significant problem because then we're not using the classroom for what the classroom was intended to be. I think participation would probably be a more granular level of engagement. Um, group work is one of the things that we use to engage the student and it has its own challenges. And now, the important thing is, is when I'm sitting with the faculty and saying to them is, is, would you like to use new technology that drives students' engagement? And congratulations, I've just done that with you. Because when you do this in the classroom, all of the students immediately engage. And they think it's very interesting and they love it. The second time around, there's interesting answers that's coming through. <coughs> Pac-Man, Pinotage, and all of those mm -hmm. words as well. So there are filters that you need to build into these things as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can make it uh, selection-based. You don't necessarily need to have it free form. What you need to convince the faculty and what we did at the business school is to say is engagement is our single biggest challenge. Exact same exercise, same experience as well. It says, can you use technology to engage your students better? And can we then use the technology that we adopt for the blended classroom? Because see, colleagues, you didn't need to be in this room to build that work cloud now. You could be in Springbok, Canada, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and maybe one day when Johannesburg gets internet, you could be in Johannesburg as well. <laughs> and then you can build that work cloud. And, and now you're engaging a student wherever they find themselves in the world. Um, the second thing that we did, um, if you wouldn't mind just the last time that I'm asking you to work on your mobile phone, is um, now we're talking about ease of use. So I just used Davies's construct of ease of use, and in Davies's construct of ease of use, um, I just defined five terms, and I said, I feel comfortable to use new technology. I think new technology will work when I use it. Um, classroom technology is often rigid and inflexible, takes significant mental effort, and support to assist with the new technology is readily available. Um, just a word of warning, how many faculty from the business school? Only yourself, Peter. I see that the learning, the, the support team is here. So for you, the answer to support to assist with the use of new technology is readily available is five out of five. <laughs> absolutely sure. And um, pl please just indicate for me um, on each of those items. And I want to show you two very interesting things here. So I've got two answers, three answers. Um, there's more than just getting feedback in terms of ease of use here. Um, you can use this in a statistics classroom as well. Because if you've done the answer, you will see that um, not only does it give you the answer, it also shows you the distribution of the answer. And if you have a sufficiently yes. large sample, um, you can use this technique to show the students visually very, very, very quickly what, what does it mean to have a significant statistical significant difference between two means because they may look by observation or by descriptive statistics different but if you look at their distributions so if you look at this one for example very interesting bimodal distribution over here here I have a narrower distribution um, there's really table mountain over there and I mean here a, a, a one tail so you can look for skewness you can look for distribution and if you have a large enough sample especially slightly less statements um, you build your own data and by building your own data you then do that so, so in terms of the word cloud, we use that to say to the faculty is, is if we get technology to engage the students, do you agree that it's useful? You don't have to show them the model. Do you agree that it's useful? And in terms of this, as we just said, is this, how easy is it to actually use it? And if we look at this now, we say, well, it's fairly interesting um, because we've got two statements in here. The one is stated in the negative, so that's actually not too bad. The last one is often rigid and inflexible. And then the significant mental effort that, now, that requires further scrutiny. And now we have some data in terms of the perceived ease of use. Now there's a very important thing in that model. It's not about ease of use. It's about perceived ease of use. Mm -hmm. And the perceived ease of use, if it's a 19 year old in front of you that was born with an iPhone in their cradle and they do something quickly, you say, yeah, all 19 year olds can do that. But if it's a 60 year old person in front of you doing that, then your mental model is significantly different because you're looking at that and you say, if he can do it, then so can I as well. And that perceived ease of use is a very interesting thing because it's not just about how easy it is to use the technology, but also how easy you make it seem to use the particular set um, of technologies. Right, thank you for your participation and engagement um, in the session. Um, the third theory um, that I want to have a, a very quick look at is the innovation diffusion. Um, we have all seen it in, in multiple different um, formats. You find it in multiple textbooks, and it's used for life cycles of many, many things, from marketing life cycles to technology life cycles. Um, but the original theory from Rogers is actually about the diffusion of innovation. It comes from 1962. 
And um, what I found interesting in this thing is that um, I first played around, I gave my students e-books eight years ago. When I gave the students e-books <coughs> eight years ago, three of them jumped up and down with joy and said, long last University of Stellenbosch is seeing the light. And two of them actually went to Von Skyke's, bought their own books for thousands of bucks and never opened their e-books. Those were the early adopters and the laggards. And the rest were all in between. And that is the reality when you bring something new into the classroom. The fact that you're in love with that, the fact that you are thinking it's great. Some of you made a note now, you had a look at Menti and you thought, that's interesting. I can use it in my classroom. Others are sitting in here and saying, <laughs> really? This is why I came to this session? And that is okay. That is the reality. Because the opposite could be true for something else as well. We have different ways, desires, and means in which we have an aspiration to and a tolerance for new technologies and the adoption of new technologies. What we used here, which was very interesting, is um, the more complex form of the model. So this is now the, the more complex form if you look at the entire model. Um, one of the exercises that I, that I do with my executive education students is you have to sell tablets into a school. So now you have these tablets, you have to sell the tablets into the school, and then they play a simulation exercise for an hour. Now, one of the key to unlock this is, is if you do not get into the ear of the principal's secretary, you cannot sell the tablets. Because the principal is a very busy lady, she is all over the show, she is highly successful in a highly successful school, but she has a gatekeeper. She will make the call, but she is the gatekeeper. And it's not about convincing the principal you need it, it's about convincing the PA of the principal to give you an audience with the principal so that you can get half an hour to get in there. Now that's one of the things embedded in the model. It says is, who is the communication channel that you actually speak to? <coughs> now it says that it's innovation itself. Some things are useful, others are less useful. Some are easier to use, others are less so. It's the communication channels. Who actually tells you about something? It's then about time. It's a level on all of these things. It, it diffuses over a period of time. You hear about your colleague making magic in the classroom next door. You would like to know about that. And over the time, it diffuses through a system. And then finally, um, the social system that you find yourself within. The pressure from the students, the pressure from engagement, the pressure from your peers, the pressure for an engaging learning experience, whatever the system is that you can find yourself in. And do you have the ability to, uh, on a Friday evening, at the Lanzarok over a glass of Pinotage, twirl your glass and say, this week I used Menti in the classroom. And everybody says, Brilliant, fantastic. <laughs> or is it just something I used PowerPoint again and I shot everybody with bullets by the middle. So, um, innovation diffusion theory, um, I have a question for you. Who conducts the faculty training session? <laughs> Peter, we're trying to arrange a training session for our faculty, for our new faculty. We have a lot of new faculty to be on board with our two new focal areas, Renal International Organizations and Healthcare Leadership. So Professor Wim de Villiers is going to learn to use the global classroom. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> now we will have a lot of support. And, um, but who conducts those training sessions? As a good educator, I will always give you a hint. There's your hint. <laughs> who conducts your training sessions for new technology? We, we, we have um, a brilliant Zimbabwean in our system. I don't know, I think it's the only good Zimbabwean, but we have him. It's called McDonald and he's sitting over there. <laughs> McDonald has a master's degree in learning and teaching technologies. He is so technology literate, I think that I modeled a new iPhone on him. So McDonald oh and he loves lecturing by the way. So do you put McDonald in front of the faculty to show them to use the new technology? Come on. Colleagues work with me here. Engage in my lecture. <laughs> Which faculty member? <laughs> Professor Andre Rue. Why? Because Professor Andre Ru is a brilliant faculty, been in the system for a long time. He does not have to change. And old school. Very, very, very old school. Because Andre is brilliant at what he's been doing for 30 years. He's lecturing in China this week, he's in Belgium next week, and I hope the week thereafter he's back for us. But if I get Andre, and I sit down, and McDonald's sit down, and I get Andre to show the faculty how he grades online, which he does, because he's one of the first ones, because I spent a lot of time in his office and helped him to grade online. I said, Andre, now I want you to show the rest of the faculty how to grade online. Mm -hmm. And you could literally see them sitting there and thinking, if Andre can do it, surely I can do it as well. <laughs> but if McDonald's showed them, they say, yeah, this brilliant Zimbabwean that we have here, I don't know if I will be able to do it because he's young, he's eager, he loves technology, and he knows how to do these things. So it's extremely important, and it sits embedded with the innovation diffusion theory. The innovation diffu diffusion theory says, those that share a message with you 
is as important as the message that I'm sharing with you. If you perceive them as being part and likely of your social system, your ability and all of these things, you're more prone to absorb that particular message and try that particular set of technology. So the answer to this question, of course, is the old dog. Please don't tell Andre I told he's the old dog. <laughs> uh, but the answer to this question is if you have the old dogs and then you have people actually listening within your lecture groups. Colleagues, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, so what is the current state of the USB? Um, and what does the future hold? Um, I think in terms of the current state, um, we are very happy with what we've achieved. Um, our geographical footprint has um, increased tremendously. I've just enrolled this first student from Barbados on this program. Um, so we'll have a student from Barbados. I actually think I'm going to switch on the sound for you. I mean, you cannot not have a, a West Indian accent in a classroom. Yeah, man, I'm so looking forward to that. Maybe it types like that as well. So um, students from all over the continent, um, East, West, um, which means a richer classroom discussion, which means interesting group work. Um, so from that perspective, um, there's a lot of things that I think that we've gained value in here. Um, that is our enrollment <coughs> figures as of Monday. Um, it's our most popular program at the moment. It didn't exist four years ago. Um, three years later, it's our most, pro most um, profitable to an extent as well, although the students still need to pay for all the facilities on campus over here according to the cost distribution model of the university. But we don't physically see them on campus. They don't uh, use electricity. They don't use nothing. They're remotely, they're away from the campus yet. Um, there's no distinction between the fees that they pay. And that's a very other interesting question. Um, and then uh, we asking ourselves how successful we were with all of this. And that's the fourth model that I didn't talk about. Um, very highly used in the world of information systems. Um, it's interesting. Um, Body and Payton wrote a very interesting article a couple of years ago to say, the title of the article was Competing Narratives on Project Success. It says if you walk into an organization and ask them, was that project to, whatever it is, put um, the future of learning on Sunland to do all of these things a success? It says, it depends on whom you speak to. The financial people will say it's a success if it was within budget. The operation people will say it was a success if it's operational. The HR people will say it was a success if nobody ran to the hills screaming and there was blood in the streets. So depending on your narrative, you have a different view on success. But Delone and McLean told us and says, is, no, no, you can actually measure it. And it's one of the things that we're busy with at the moment because within that we hope to uncover new information about what are the elements that we need to um, improve on this. We have two interesting articles in, 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 in progress at the moment. We have another two articles in the sphere. The one is about the value of the back channel. Um, so on the left hand side, that's where the students type and communicate with us. Um, and there's very interesting work done in that space. Um, do the other students see it as a distraction? Does it help them? How does it work? One of the things, for example, that we find is we always like to give a grade for classroom participation. The problem with the grade for classroom participation, if I need to give every person in this room now a grade, you needed to have name cards, and you needed to trust me at the end of this lecture to go to my list here and then to make a, a comment in terms of how much out of five will I give you for classroom participation, zero to five. We just export that log at the end of a four-hour session, a two-hour session, another two-hour session. Now I have a complete visibility on all the engagement from the students because they answer questions, they ask questions, and all of a sudden we are slightly less subjective when we deal with classroom participation for our online students, but still the same for our, for our classroom students. And then the second interesting thing is just the set of technologies that we're using here. We're using the Sunlearn peer review um, uh, functionality. And what we found is um, it's a very interesting early predictor in terms of struggling students. Because if you have multiple students doing peer reviews and you've got one student that's an outlier, but the data tells us those outlier <coughs> students are actually the students that struggle at the end of the learning process. So you don't have to wait for their first assessment. You actually know fairly early on that the students that are very inaccurate at grading the work of their peers hmm. as compared to their other peers, groups of three. So just the outlier out of a little group, uh, groups of four, the outlier of a group of four. That's a student you need to get special attention to because my inability to make sense from a peer's work is a reflection on my inability to make sense of the work for myself as well and in my learning process as well. So um, the final one is an interesting one for me and I think this is one of the biggest risks that we are dealing with. Um, I remember the first, um, and, and Josh and, and McDonald, you guys will remember this well, the first time that the faculty need to go, and go to the local classroom, they were there 20 minutes before the lecture. 20 minutes before the lecture because you were ready, because there's an interactive whiteboard, you can flip to the interactive whiteboard and all of these things. And all of the faculty had this fear about, will I survive in this environment? So 15 minutes before the lecture, you were there, you were ready, and the IT team again took you through all of these things you're comfortable. 
Today, it's become nonchalant, commonplace. Oh, I'm in the local classroom again. You pitch up two or three minutes before the time. And you don't give yourself sufficient time to ensure that everything is working and everything is fine. And I think that which has become <coughs> a differentiator for us, which we are extremely good at, and can become a little bit of a threat for us as well. Because if your systems don't operate well, it's fantastic to have students all across the world. If your stream breaks, if the faculty can't do it, if things go wrong, then it's as if the half of your class from the Wagerop in the class, from the other class, they're gone. And now you have a little bit of a problem. And um, we need to think about our behavior and how do we ensure um, stability within our operations, ensure redundancy within our systems. Um, th there's a lot of things that, that um, I can share with you that, for example, we've got um, the team from the Learning Up monitoring as real time. If I'm working on the interactive learning board and I'm writing on the board and my pen is dry, I literally write on the board and I say, oh, if my green pen is dry, would one of the team please mind bringing me a green pen? I just put it down, I continue lecturing. Two minutes later, miraculously, the door opens, <laughs> Josh comes walking and he gives me a green pen. I say, thanks, Josh, everything, and I keep on and I keep on working. Um, because that's the amount of support that we've put in the background. If you do not necessarily have that, you have a little bit of a problem because your dry green pen means something significantly different than what it means in a classroom um, where all of your students are. <laughs> Colleagues, um, final slide. It's been an interesting ride. Um, I think a technological transformation requires careful planning. Um, as we know in project management, the principle is it doesn't matter how long you plan, the first thing always goes wrong one second into your project. It doesn't mean that you don't plan. You have to plan and then you have to react against the things that go wrong. Um, you have to pay respect to the theory. There's a lot of theory in the technology world that helps us to understand why people use technology, why do they not use new technology, how to react in this particular world. Um, I think it requires hard work and thirsty horses, and if they're not thirsty enough, just push them deep enough into the water. <laughs> and um, I think it can, can provide significant returns. Um, we, we're not close to where we need to be. Um, I'm under no illusion. I think probably the single biggest risk for us is that um, we're doing what we wanted to do four years ago. We're doing well now. And I think we have another year on this. I think if, we, if we're entering 2020 using technology as we use now, um, I think the market is going to spit us out. Um, there is a, a desperate need for us to take the next step. Um, Johannesburg is launching a new business school next year. I knew there was something afoot in Johannesburg because I picked up um, IP addresses that we couldn't trace logging into our blended MBA classroom from Johannesburg from within UJ. Two IP addresses for a couple of evenings. And I then just realized, and then weeks later it came out, Johannesburg is launching business school, a new blended MBA and all of these things. And um, it means they benchmarked on us. The ethics of that is another story, but they benchmarked. They sat into our classes, they looked at what we did, and at the level best, they're going to do what we do better next year. And if we are still doing that, then I think we have a problem. So um, we, we need to get our faculty to make use of this, and it's a very much a part of our onboarding process now. Um, we need to get rewarding and incentive schemes for faculty that walk the extra mile. Um, efficient and seamless 24-7 support processes. We're looking at artificial intelligence at the moment. 80% of the support, um, the technical support, you can have artificial intelligence agents help you with passwords and all of these things. We don't need people, but our students are becoming around the clock and around the world. And unless we can support them in that environment, um, we're going to feel the pain. And then I think the, the two remaining challenges, oh, and then securing our online assessments. When your students are no longer on campus to have these test books with the corner is folded over and stick to something and then write in. Um, but the student is anywhere in the world. Um, how do you assess them? How do you know that, that that student? How do you do all of these things? And um, that remains a, a huge challenge for us. Lots of interesting things that we've done, but there's some, some work that we need to do there. Um, for me, the, the last two bullets, disrupting ourselves. Um, Platian Christensen's The Innovator's Dilemma says the single biggest challenge for an innovator Arnold said that I was the driver behind the global classroom. It was a massive team of people. But what Leighton Christensen says is if Martin Butler was fundamental to establishing that, he is potentially the biggest stumbling block to the next leap that you're going to do. Because you have so much vested interest in what you've done. You are so, you love your baby. Oh, my <laughs> local classroom. I love you. When somebody comes with something new, you say, no. Don't come with those tendencies here, you agent. You know, that's not the things that I want to do. So, and that's our challenge. If we do not disrupt ourselves, if we are still doing this very well in a year or two or three down the line, then I think we're going to have a serious problem. We have to think about what is the next step that we do. And in terms of doing that, is, um, we have to think very really carefully in terms of getting the funding to be able to do that, or strategic partnerships. And, and, and together with Arnold and Antoinette and lots of people, um, we are looking at lots of existing partnerships that university have. 
um, to use these guys and not reinvent the wheel. Um, there's established relationships and growing relationships. There's capabilities within the Center of Teaching and Learning. Um, and at the Business School, um, we've worked closely with the Center of Teaching and Learning and uh, uh, Teaching Technologies, JP and his entire team. Um, JP has spent time on our campus. We intend to do that in the future as well, but also broader in terms of where the university is heading so um, that we can have that, that next step up into the future. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. That was uh, great. So um, I will hand the microphone to anybody. Um, it's not amplified, but it's just so that we can record the question and have the answer. So who would like to make a comment? Thank you very much, Martin. On is it right? Okay. I have two questions. The first one being, how do you think that the learning from the student side changed due to the local classroom? And secondly, your views and directions on security in terms of IPs logging into your class that shouldn't be there, and secondly, security in assessments. You don't hold back. I think those are two, two of the fundamental questions. Um, I think in terms of the learning process, um, some of the things that we did that I didn't necessarily focus on here is our students to a very large extent became co-creators of the learning. Um, so there's a lots of sets of technologies where the students um, became very much part of this. So within the journey, um, we, we also looked at what do the students actually do? Um, uh, how do we ensure that the students within the learning process also use the technology? So there's a lot of interesting things that we did with the students where we said is, seeing that our assessment is no longer written in a textbook, what does it actually allow us to do? And um, the feedback on that, which we've done some research on, is, is absolutely phenomenal by getting the students um, through more innovative modes of assessment, getting their levels of engagement higher and really being part of it. So, so two of the examples that come to mind immediately is we have a module called Perspectives on African Frontiers, and in that module, um, one class is a panel discussion. And what we do in the panel discussion is we bring two experts of Africa, and the students need to bring two experts of Africa. We have an hour and a half panel discussion about Africa, the future, stunning, interesting, fantastic people. Now we say to ourselves is, how do we assess the learning? So it's really simple. Let the students write a press release. So the students have to write in group format a press release after the panel discussion. Those press releases, we actually say them in business communication, this is what should be within a good press release. The press release, the students have to reflect about the classroom, um, they have to reflect about that, they have to put out the, the key quotes, they have to put it in there, and then they submit it. And then what we then do with those press releases, we take the best one from every class, and we put it into the media as well. And a fantastic exposure for the business school, and the students are so proud of being part of creating the content mm. throughout their process. So that's one of the things that we do. Um, some of the other things that we do is, is getting the students um, to do particular things like creating a video about the digital transformation for the organization that they're working with. Very interesting is grading it criteria associated with that. So um, we, we, the, the answer to now to an extent is by also looking at how technology and the processes can make them co-create and take part within the particular learning process. I, I think the caveat that I need to put on that is, will we do blended learning for all our students? And I think the answer is no. Because some of the students tell you that I want to be physically present within the classroom. I want to sit there, I want to engage, and I want to be there. And we have to respect that. Whereas many of the other students said, if it wasn't for this mode of delivery, I simply would not have been able to study. Um, and that changes their mindset as well. It's not a second best option. It is the only fantastic option. And I'm very grateful to the university to, to do that. Second question in terms of the security is a very is a very interesting one. Um, the, the the educational world at large um, is to an extent under attack um, from many 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 different places. It could be partners, it could be uh, competitors within the market as well. Um, it, it sometimes people are just out to make a name for themselves. I was able to bring the Sunburn system to its knees, and now um, I am the hacker of the world. And um, it's something that um, we work very, very closely with Ati's team, um, the team on main campus, um, to ensure that whatever we push out into this new environment, um, that we ensure that it's safe. Now, um, when, JP, when I, when I received your invite, I was actually in Stockholm at the Amber Conference telling him about our global classroom. And afterwards, um, and, it, and, and I shared the classroom with a, with a colleague from uh, Europe and from the USA. 
And um, my, the theme of mine was, is how can I create 80% of the value for 20% of the funds? Because I just explained to them, is, yes, we would like to have fully authenticated login and Adobe Connect that would cost us an extra 2 million rand a year. Yes, we would have like, yes, we would like to have that. And I think the vindication for me is when I was done, Professor Erna Svetlana from um, Irvis Business, Business School in Moscow, um, she came to me and she stood next to me and she says, very good, you come help us. When? <laughs> when? <laughs> and um, I had a very good conversation with her. I promised there was no vodka involved. Um, but in many, many places across the world, they are also sitting with, um, we do not have the funds to do some of these amazing, amazing things. And it's one of the ongoing things that we have to work very closely with Ati and his team and, and make sometimes some very difficult trade-offs in terms of, Yes, you can completely block out anybody from locking in if you have a th authentication that of, is it worth two million rand? And on an ongoing basis, we, we need to do that. The one thing um, that I would like to add, um, which I always keep on the back burner because um, people don't necessarily believe that until you sh start showing the data, is, is in terms of security and authentication and all of these things, is I have more insight, more visibility, and more control over my online remote students than in my classroom students. Mm. I know when you logged in, I know when you logged out. I know what you said, I know how you said it, I know what you did and all of these things. So um, in terms of understanding the behavior of our online students, we understand it extremely well because we create massive sets of real-time data to which we haven't really applied the sufficient learning analytics and I think that's something that we need to use in the future. Okay, um, I think we have to answer for one more question mm. perhaps. There at the back. Hi, Martin. Thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed your talk. I also am very fond of using technology in, in whatever I teach. Question. Um, I use different activities as well. How do you, I'm just curious, how do you plan timing of all of these things from a student perspective. Obviously, if you give them five or six different things to do, technology-based, you have to time it properly for them that you don't overburden them with whatever way of you know, learning that you are targeting for that specific activity. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I actually answer it on two different levels because um, the, the one thing that we've instituted um, four years ago, um, which I think is tremendously valuable, is notional hours of learning. It was also a mechanism to control my faculty because faculty only see their module in isolation and they very quickly overburden the students. Or I've had a faculty now that wants the students to do a conference in digital enterprise management. I'm saying to you, you have 80 hour notional hours of learning in your entire module. By doing that, you will assess 5% of the learning outcomes for 40% of the next year time. It simply doesn't make any sense. So at the, at the highest level within our module, when we look at all the different activities of the students, we are very strict in terms of assigning notional hours of learning. So whenever we have this great idea about writing a press release, doing that, doing that, and doing that, um, we, we are very strict and we, we, it, it's, it's something that we enforce very, very well. If you go to the classroom activities itself, um, there you pay a little bit of a premium for your online. For example, we use Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts work perfectly for our students with the groups. But what we say to the faculty is, is, if I want to group exercise in this room now, and I'm saying turn to each other in groups of two or three or four of these things, I give you five minutes to do that. The moment that we do that online, it has to become seven minutes. You have to take cognizance of the fact that there's two minutes in setting up, opening Google Hangouts and all of these things. So when we're designing technology intrinsic activities, we are aware of the fact that we're paying a premium. And that means that you need to be very careful to not just try another thing and another thing and another thing, but that you, that you recognize your five minute exercise now takes seven minutes or your 15 minutes exercise do that. You sometimes schedule them after breaks. I would sometimes um, say to the student, your break is due in five minutes, so you have five minutes to discuss this, have a break, I'll see you in 10 minutes. So there are particular ways of doing that, but you're spot on. You, you do pay a premium of, of, of doing that. What is also interesting is one of the challenges that we've had is that faculty use lots of different technologies. And um, especially when the faculty get excited, I'm using Instagram and this person is using Twitter and, 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 and now you're paying that premium, um, the overhead premium on everything because if the student only needs to use Google Hangouts, eventually it becomes 30 seconds to get the group going. But if we are using Slack and now we're using this and now we're using that and now we're using that and now we're using that, then um, it takes a period of time for the students to say, oh, so what, what, what are we doing now? It's like asking them to write with green, red, blue, 
pink and purple pens. They, they first need to spend the first 10 minutes to get the right pen before they start the writing. And it's one of the most unpopular decisions that I took at the MBA faculty meeting three weeks ago and to say is group collaboration is Google Hangouts. And then the faculty says, yes, but Slack is better for this and this. I say, I know in isolation it's better for your module, but for the students in the entire learning process, mm. an efficient use of student time, that is what we stand the rise on. And you have to sometimes make those tough, tough decisions. Donald, you'll be happy with that. Google Hangouts. No longer 10 different platforms to do that. Okay. Let's give it so, um, Thank you very much, Martin. That was entertaining and informative. And I think you're all, again, enthused by uh, what we can do when we think differently and uh, are a bit there and how we offer our teaching and how we facilitate the learning. So, um, colleagues, from my side, thank you for everything in the past year for being part of this forum. Um, good luck with the year-end work. There's still some pressure. Uh, there's stress and challenges. But remember, uh, if you get the, these symptoms, I call it Novemberitis. <laughs> there's always pinotage and lint chocolates. <laughs> Enjoy your afternoon, guys.